Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, coming back. I hope you've all had a short but uh, pleasant break. And we are now going to follow up with Zahar Hassan, uh, who's going to speak to us as to why a rights-based based approach makes a just lasting political solution more likely and why now. And by way of introduction, Zahar is a human rights lawyer, visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her research focuses on Palestine-Israel peace, the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements and US foreign policy in the region. She, previously, she was the coordinator and senior legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team during Palestine's bid for UN membership. The member of the Palestine, Palestinian delegation to the quartet sponsored exploratory talks between 2011 and 2012. She's a regular participant and commentator on media and in the New York Times, Al Jazeera and many other outlets. Sahar, over to you and welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to all the organizers of the conference for including me in these discussions um, happening over the next couple of days. It's really an honor to be among you and the rest of the speakers who I admire very, very much. Uh, the question I wanted to consider with you for the next few minutes is the following. In light of the serious human rights situation in Palestine, Israel, which has devolved into what many consider apartheid, how ought Palestinian Israeli peacemaking be reimagined moving forward? Given the title of this segment of the conference program and what you just heard, you will have guessed I'll be talking about a rights based approach. But what do I mean by that? And how can a new approach lead to a durable political solution? Before getting into that, it's a good idea to assess the events of the last 40 or so days from the start of the latest ex uh, escalation of violence. There was a gradual lead up to the 11 day bombardment of Gaza that has been allowed to drop off the news cycle and from the lips of politicians who were quick to reaffirm Israel's right to self-defense without reference to any rights that Israel might owe to Palestinians under international law, including those contained under the law of occupation and human rights law. From the first day of Ramadan, we saw Israeli authorities ratchet up tensions in Jerusalem in a way that seemed gratuitous and to have no logic. The speakers for the Mu'eddin's call to prayer, for example, were cut by Israeli authorities in Jerusalem on the first day of Ramadan. The Easter procession was obstructed in the old city and worshipers assaulted. Then came the barricading of the plaza of the Damascus Gate, despite it being a center for youth and worshipers to congregate and celebrate Ramadan nights. We saw Israeli police side with and protect um, a, Jew a Jewish extremist group as it paraded provocatively in front of Palestinian youth in the old city chanting Arabs get out. Then there was the looming forced displacement in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, neighborhood of East Jerusalem, where you know, Palestinian refugee families who'd already been displaced before in 1948 um, were being uh, assaulted and attacked by settlers uh, under the protection of the police. And then of course, we saw the storming of the Haram al-Sharif Esplanade by Israeli police on one of the holiest days of Ramadan in the holiest month of the Muslim calendar and one of the most sacred spaces to Muslims leaving hundreds injured. So during the course of this escalation of tensions, where was the United States? Where was the EU? And where was the United Kingdom? Powers that hold some sway with Israel and who might have had some ability to pull Israeli officials back from further escalation or who could have at least shown some leadership in reaffirming the international legal order to which Israel is bound. They were not entirely absent. There were statements about both sides needing to de-escalate, but one side is a defenseless population under occupation, and the other is a militarized state that has been maintaining a brutal occupation for more than half a century, and who legal experts say is guilty of the crime of persecution and apartheid against the other side. In effect, the statement to both sides was read as a green light to one of the sides, Israel, and that sense of impunity is what led us to the bombardment of Gaza. And that's the problem with international engagement on peacemaking between Israelis and Palestinians. It has been contradictory for the last 30 years. 
while expressing support for a two-state solution and the establishment of a democratic Palestinian state, the international community has refrained from using its levers of power to stem the tide of, of Israel's illegal settlement expansion and human rights abuses. In the case of the United States, not only has it refused to use the levers of its power with Israel, its very close ally, but paradoxically, it has been all too willing to use those same levers to constrain Palestinian diplomatic efforts at the UN and with third states and legal efforts to prevent impunity in places like the International Criminal Court. The failure to hold Israel to its commitments and legal obligations during U.S. mediation of the peace process and America's deprioritization of Palestinian good governance and accountability effectively undercut Israeli and Palestinian constituencies who supported a political agreement through negotiations. After all the financial, legal, diplomatic, and moral support that has been given to Israel, doing nothing now makes the international community complicit in war crimes and crimes against humanity. How is it that there is not outrage by the international community at the fact that for 13 years, Palestinians in Gaza have been trapped inside a tiny strip of land, subjected to repeated bombing campaigns for in the last 12 years, by an Israeli military whose strategy dictates the use of disproportionate force against civilian populations and civilian infrastructure? How is it that we have allowed 2 million people to be condemned to a subsistence level existence? A new approach to Israel-Palestine conflict resolution is obviously needed now, one that prioritizes rights and human security. Such an approach would help restore respect for the rules-based international order something that uh, the Biden administration is championing at the moment by eliminating exceptions, particularly the Israel exception. It also holds the most promise for changing the political calculations currently steering Palestinians and Israelis away from a durable political solution. But what is the, the frame of reference for a rights-based approach and how can it get us to a durable solution? First, we should acknowledge that a rights-based approach to matters involving international peace and security is not new. Prioritizing universal values and norms is what undergirds the international legal order created in the aftermath of World War II that we heard discussed earlier. That's why we have the Geneva Conventions to, pr to protect civilians and occupied people during times of war, the United Nations system, and the human rights treaties and associated mechanisms pr to promote respect for rights and well-being of peoples and to advance decolonization. However, the order has been buckling under the weight of its contradictions for years now. For sure, it hasn't prevented grave human rights situations like the ethnic cleansing in former Yugoslavia, genocide in Rwanda, and forced population transfer of the Rohingya from Myanmar, but that isn't a reason to walk away from it. A meaningful and positive, even if modest, international response to the Israel-Palestine situation could help change the negative trends on the ground. And we shouldn't forget that the international community bears significant responsibility for the situation in Israel-Palestine because of its support for the partition of historic Palestine into two ethno-religious states. The UN has been occupied with the matter ever since in dealing with the humanitarian concerns of Palestine's refugees successive Arab-Israeli wars, and the deteriorating human rights conditions in the occupied territories. International engagement on the situation in Israel-Palestine has and will continue to come into conflict with our fundamental values unless there is a recalibration of approach. We all know what these rights are. They are enshrined in the United Nations Charter, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and on the other, in the other human rights conventions. We also know which ones Israel has been violating. As we heard earlier, the 2004 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice determined that Israel has been violating the right to self-determination, work, freedom of movement, and protection of families and children, and the right to an adequate standard of living, health, and education. The World Court also determines that all states, parties to the Geneva Convention have an obligation to ensure compliance by Israel and to cease all aid to Israel that supports its violations. 
That means a rights-based approach is not only about centering values for value's sake, it also is a legal obligation of the international community. Now I wanna to turn to how a rights-based approach helps us get to a durable solution. A rights-based approach improves the environment for a political solution by creating costs for maintaining the status quo. In this sense, a rights-based approach is not some placeholder that prioritizes conflict mitigation until more conducive political conditions materialize. Instead, it's the conduit for creating those very necessary conditions. Now, how does it do this? It does this in three ways. First, it makes international engagement more credible to both Israelis and Palestinians. If human rights were centered and there was accountability for the violation of rights and international law, Palestinian trust in international engagement would grow as would support for negotiations that could lead to an agreement. Today, there's very little support among Palestinians for negotiations. Now in Israel, accountability would clarify expectations for leaders creating costs in the bilateral relationship would have ripple effects down through the Israeli electorate that could begin to reverse the trajectory toward annexation of the West Bank and further rights abuses. Second, centering rights can inspire the necessary public confidence and create momentum for, re for reaching a political agreement. Some 75% of Palestinians believe that the chances of an independent Palestinian state coming to fruition in the next five years is either low or very low. About 62% believe the two-state solution is no longer possible. Likewise, inside Israel, nearly 85% of Israelis believe a solution in the next five years is somewhat unlikely or very unlikely. These views are tied to the repeated failures of the peace process, as well as the worsening realities on the ground. Today, neither Israeli nor Palestinian leaders have an incentive to create political constituencies to back a negotiated solution. In Israel, the US approach failed to create any real costs for right-wing nationalist policies. The message from Washington was that the US-Israel relationship is sacrosanct and won't be jeopardized by pressing Israel on its conduct vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. In Israel, political parties coalesced around anti-Palestinian policies without fear of alienating vital allies like the US. In Palestine, political parties committed to negotiations undercut their own legitimacy by repeatedly committing to a failed peace process that demanded much of them while allowing settlements to expand cost-free. If Israeli policies that violated rights and previous commitments came with costs attached to the U.S.-Israel relationship, for example, it would over time force a recalculation and promote politics that are more amenable to political negotiation. On the Palestinian side, it would allow parties committed to negotiation to garner the faith of their publics. Now, third, a rights-based approach would correct the imbalance of power between Israel and the Palestinians and provide Palestinians some agency to bolster international consensus around their rights. This would have a better chance of spurring Israel to take its obligations more seriously as an occupying power and to negotiate consistent with principles of international legitimacy. The previous U.S. approach, crafting positions on peace proposals or, pre or parameters with Israel, while inhibiting Palestinians uh, access to diplomatic or legal uh, fora, such as the UN or at the International Criminal Court, effectively allowed Israel to maintain its occupation at no cost. At the end of the day, even if there was no headway made on a negotiated political solution, the international community should avoid complicity in grave human rights abuses and work to uphold the legal order by, at the minimum, not providing political cover and financial benefits to Israel that facilitate and prolong its domination over Palestinians. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Zaha. That was a very interesting overview. Now, I think it's now our task to bring Michael uh, Svard in to uh, our conversation. I don't know whether Michael is there somewhere and is about to be brought in, and then I can introduce him. Um, and then we are going to have a conversation between the two of you. And here is Michael, who looks as if he's on the point of joining us from... Can you hear me? 
Good afternoon, Michael. Hi. Uh, very good to see you. I was just about to introduce you and explain that you are a lawyer specializing in international human rights and laws of war with special emphasis on the law of belligerent occupation. You've served as counsel in many cases on these topics in Israel, including the successful litigations for the removal of settlements built on private Palestinian lands like Migron and Amona, petitions concerning the separation barrier, challenge to the Israeli policy of targeted killings and challenge to the constitutionality of the regularization law, which ordered the confiscation of private Palestinian lands and allocated them for the use of Israeli previously unpermitted settlements. You're a legal advisor to a number of Israeli human rights and humanitarian organizations, and you represent Palestinian communities and Israeli and Palestinian activists. You grew up in Jerusalem. You served in the Israeli Defense Forces. You were uh, sent to prison for three weeks as a conscientious objector, refusing to serve in Hebron. And you are a graduate of the law faculty of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I won't go into the many national and international awards you have received for your work, which I think everybody knows has been carried out in the most challenging of circumstances. And you have written a number of books on the subject of Israel's policy towards uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. Michael, welcome. Um, I think the suggestion is that you should uh, speak. And then when you have uh, been able to do so, uh, we will then have a conversation between you and Zahar, who I hope you've been able to listen to, uh, in which I may also join as a bit of a moderator, but I think I'll leave it largely to the two of you uh, to continue your conversation. Over to you. Thank you, Dominic. Um, and I want to thank the Balfour Project for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for a really fascinating uh, conference uh, up till now. Um, uh, Ms. Hassan had uh, the opportunity to um, suggest some solutions or a, a roadmap to um, uh, solving the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I have uh, the, thank the thankless task of highlighting um, some um, sides of the problem. Um, and in order to do so, um, I will have to dive from the heights of international law, which were discussed uh, before me and um, into the you know, ground resolution of domestic law and how uh, the rule of law is being um, professed, uh, abused uh, in, in the uh, occupied Palestinian territory. Um, I mean, one of the things about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that one has to, um, to acknowledge is that um, Israel has fragmented the Palestinian people into several parts, um, each one with a different legal status. Um, we have the Palestinians that live in the occupied Palestinian territory, which also can be uh, um, divided between the West Bank, which are governed by a specific set of norms, uh, policies, and practices. There are uh, Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem, um, who are subjected to a different set of, of policies and, and normative framework. And then you have the people in Gaza, who, as you know, are uh, in a completely different situation. And also the people who, the, the Palestinians who live in Israel and are Israeli nationals, they are, of course, uh, uh, nationals of the state of Israel, citizens of the state of Israel, and they uh, enjoy and suffer from different uh, normative uh, rules uh, um, altogether. And I won't even get to the Palestinian refugees who live in other countries, which of course, uh, this is a, another story. So I wanna uh, focus on uh, the law that applies to Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that all the audience uh, understands that this is only part of the Palestinian people and only part of the Palestinian people who are under Israeli domination. Um, so the idea of the rule of law, which is the topic of this conference, is a noble idea. Um, as a lawyer, I think it is a noble idea. The idea that uh, we all uh, participate in adopting, in a process of adopting the norms uh, 
that will equally apply to all of us. Uh, and that way, um, we, um, the chances that we will be living under norms that would enable us to, um, to flourish um, is, is, is much uh, 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 bigger. That, that idea um, of the rule of law is not um, being uh, applied in, in the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, Dominic has uh, mentioned that the opposite of the rule of law is not necessarily anarchy, but the rule by law. Um, the use or the abuse of law as a, as a, as a sword rather than a shield, not as one that uh, um, uh, generates uh, defense for rights, but, uh, uh, but otherwise um, allows the, uh, the power to abuse rights. And the rule by law sometimes is a di diabolical idea. And one of the ways that the rule of law becomes a rule by law is when one group, one community is uh, using and exploiting its power, its political power, economic power, military power um, to divide the law, the norms that govern a certain area in a way that will apply differently to different groups. And this is exactly what happens in, uh, in, 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 in the West Bank. And now I'll focus on the West Bank and, and then I'll say a word about East Jerusalem. As you all know, Israel has engaged in a massive uh, uh, project of colonization of the West Bank in, in the past and, and East Jerusalem and in the past in Gaza Strip as well. Uh, to date, there are more than half a million Israeli nationals, all of them Jewish, uh, living in the West Bank. Uh, in the midst of a community of 3 million uh, Palestinians. Um, the international, international law, as was discussed before, uh, prohibits, with no exception, the transfer of citizens from the occupying power into the occupied territory. And when I'm asked by students and, 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 and by people that I talk to why international law prohibits, I direct them to the situation in the West Bank and show, to prevent exactly what is going on in the West Bank. When community of the occupying of, uh, of citizens from the occupying power occupies, immigrates, colonizes the occupied territory, two communities are created that are completely uh, uh, different in rights, in, in political power, and in every other aspect. And this is exactly what happened in the West Bank. We have a community of Israelis who live there. They have full political and civil rights as nationals of the state of Israel. In that way, they have an impact on the corridors of power where the norms that govern their lives is being uh, decided. There is another community, the community of Palestinians, and they are a community that are completely dispossessed of, of political and, and, and civil rights. According to international law, their civil and political rights are being suspended for the duration of the occupation. So when we have this huge imbalance one community that has full civil and political rights, the possibility to vote and to be elected and run to government, and the other has none of this. Um, it is almost, almost inherent that all the resources of the land will be diverted to the community uh, of, of citizens of, uh, of, of the occupying power. Now, what has happened in the West Bank was that not only that the community of Jewish settlers that have colonized the West Bank have been provided through policy and practice with all of the riches and all of the uh, uh, um, resources of the land in matter of ter land, water, um, natural resources, etc. But also in terms of law, they have been uh, showered with modern law to apply to them when their neighbors in the Palestinian villages, towns and cities have none of this. And how did that happen? When Israelis, when Jewish Israelis have immigrated to the West Bank, they did not think that they are moving outside the state of Israel. They didn't go there to be under a military occupation government. They went there in order to extend the borders of the state of Israel, and they wanted and still want to feel that when they are there, they are still in Israel, and they are governed by the same norms and same laws and the same policies that their brethren inside 1948 or 1949 uh, uh, Israel uh, are, are, are uh, being subjected to. And Israel indeed has 
apply the Israeli law in certain in different ways to them, to the Israelis when they are in the West Bank. So I'll, I'll lay down three such uh, mechanisms um, that Israel has uh, uh, used in order to apply Israeli law, Israeli Knesset legislated, Israeli parliament legislated laws on, on Israelis when they are in the West Bank. So one thing is that many Israeli laws, many Israeli acts of parliament um, have been applied to Israeli nationals extraterritorially and personally when they are in the West Bank. So modern law that is, that is territorial, modern law speaks of a territory as the field where laws uh, of a certain uh, legislator apply, right? When I go to London, I am subjected to British, to, to, to English law. And when I go to the Netherlands, I'm subjected to a Dutch law. But when Israelis go to the West Bank, when I go to the West Bank, I'm driving or I'm, go, I'm traveling to the West Bank with a bubble of Israeli law that is surrounding me. And so I get there, whether I live there or if I'm just visiting there, I'm still subjected to Israeli laws that have application extraterritorially on me personally because I'm an Israeli. Now, what that makes is two systems of laws, one applied to Israelis and one applies to Palestinians. The laws that apply to Israelis are modern laws that have been legislated by uh, a parliament um, that was elected by the people of Israel. And the laws that apply to Palestinians are a combination of the previous rulers of the West Bank laws, Jordanian, even Ottoman and British mandatory laws, together with military laws that have been issued uh, by ordinances of the military commander of the West Bank. So I'll give you an example of how that plays out. Let's say that an Israeli commits a crime in the West Bank. Let's say in, a in, in the settlement of Tkwa, there is such a settlement named Tkwa. Um, and that crime is a crime of manslaughter. Now let's say that a neighbor in the Palestinian village of Tkwa, yes, there's also a Palestinian village with the same name, Tkwa, also commits the same crime, the crime of manslaughter. They will be treated by different authorities. They will be tried by a different court and according to different, a different penal code and different penal procedure. And of course, the penal procedure and the penal code that applies to the Israeli is a modern penal procedure and penal uh, criminal code, uh, 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 which allows all the uh, uh, rights of the suspected and the and 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 and, and uh, the uh, uh, per people who are uh, being detained, while the Palestinian will be uh, subjected to a military law that is very draconian and allows for a, a, a grave violations of his rights. So again, one will be subject will be detained by the Israeli police, the Israeli civil police, and they can hold him up to 24 hours because this is what the Israeli law prescribes. If they want to extend uh, the uh, detention, they will have to bring the, the detainee before a magistrate court judge, which will be able to extend uh, the detention by up to 15 days and altogether 30 days. The Palestinian, however, will be uh, detained by the Israeli army, will be held for up to four days and then will be brought before a military court judge that can extend the detention by a whole month and up to three months altogether. The Israeli will face, if, if, if charged with manslaughter, will face a trial in the Jerusalem district court and will face up to 20 years imprisonment, which is the uh, uh, maximum penalty for manslaughter in Israel. And the Palestinian, if charged with the crime of uh, manslaughter will be tried in a military court before military officers and will, be, it will face up to life imprisonment because this is the uh, maximum penalty for manslaughter in the military law. Two crimes, two identical crimes committed in the same geopolitical uh, territory, same one. The only difference is the nationality of the, of the suspect or perpetrator. Now, this is, was just one example. There are many laws that apply to Israelis, 
and to Palestinians that are completely different this, uh, uh, through the mechanism of applying uh, Israeli laws um, extraterritorially and personally on Israelis while in the West Bank. The second mechanism that was used by the, uh, uh, by the Israeli uh, uh, system was um, the um, application through military orders of Israeli administrative laws on the um, um, local governments of the settlements. So we have local governments of settlements, of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And one can ask oneself, how does the Ministry of Education, the Israeli Ministry of Education has the power to uh, run schools in the settlement? How does the Ministry, the Israeli Ministry of Health has uh, um, the power to run clinics or hospitals in, in settlements? These, are area, these settlements are located in areas where the Israeli law does not apply. Well, the military commander, given an order by the Israeli government, has issued orders applying Israeli administrative law to the, to the territory of the settlements. We call it the enclave law. There are is, enclaves of Israeli administrative law that pertain to the settlements. And that is why when a, when a settler, when an Israeli immigrates, colonizes uh, uh, the West Bank, they do not feel a change in government. They still have the Israeli officials and the Israeli ministries taking care of their business there. And the third type of, uh, of uh, um, um, discriminative uh, norms that apply to Palestinian and Israelis in the West Bank are laws, uh, are military ordinances that have been issued by the military commander and explicitly and blatantly apply to either Palestinians or, or Israelis. So for example, um, um, Professor Sands has, uh, 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 I'm calling him Professor Sands because he was my teacher uh, at the University College of London many years ago. Uh, he mentioned the, the, the wall case um, and um, the Israeli separation wall or separation barrier. Um, the, all the territory between the separation uh, um, barrier and the green line that composes some more than 8% of the West Bank uh, has been designated a closed military zone. But that closed military zone, which, which men, means that whoever wants to enter that zone must have a permit from the military commander. But, that, but the declaration of the, military, of the closed military zone made it clear that it does not apply to Israelis. And so you have a closed military zone declaration that does not apply to Israelis. By the way, Israelis being defined as one of the following three, citizens of the state of Israel, permanent residents of the state of Israel, and embarrassingly, any person who has a right to become a citizen of the state of Israel according to the Israeli law of return. That means any Jew everywhere in the world. That means that every Every yeshiva student from Brooklyn has more rights to enter the military, the closed military zone, the, the seam zone between the, the um, separation barrier and the green line than people, Palestinians, who have lived there for generations, whose parents were born there. They need a permit from the military commander in order to enter there. And again, this is just an example. There are many military orders which uh, apply different set of prohibitions and rights or privileges to the Jewish Israeli community of the West Bank and to Palestinians. So all three of those things create a system, a reality, a legal reality of two different sets of laws that apply to each uh, 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 group. And that is in place in order to facilitate the uh, uh, privileges and the um, rapid development of the Jewish community in the West Bank and to curb and to curb any development of the Palestinian uh, community. And that has been in place for years and just became more and more complicated as years uh, went by. Now, I th that is one aspect of the, of the military government of the West Bank. Um, and, 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 you know, again, the word apartheid is already 
um, spelled, has been spelled out here. And I wanna uh, say that for me, I mean, there are many uh, practices and policies that Israel applies in the West Bank, which facilitate this notion of domination and, 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 and oppression of one group by another group, of the Palestinians by the Jewish Israelis in the West Bank. And, and, and there are many policies and practices, including you know, land expropriation mass, on massive scale, um, forced displacement of communities, uh, persecution, all kinds of, of inhuman acts that together with this context, this reality of domination of, and oppression of one group over another brought me uh, a year ago in June of 2020 to author a report for the Israeli human rights organization Yeshdin, which I'm the lead legal advisor of and one of the uh, founders, which uh, uh, reaches the very sad conclusion for me as an Israeli that the crime, the international, the crime of apartheid, the, which is uh, uh, classified as a crime against humanity is being committed in the West Bank. Um, and, um, and, and, and unfortunately, I think uh, it is very difficult today to refute that, that argument. It, we're not, you know, we're not, uh, um, it's not a, a risk or, 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 or a threat of, 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 of apartheid. We have apartheid. And I think one of the, one of the uh, most striking um, facets of, of this apartheid is indeed the, the dual legal system that we have applied uh, in, in, in the West Bank. Now, I, I'm, I'm not sure how long I still have, but I wanna say a word about East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem, as you all know, was also, uh, uh, is also an occupied territory, although it was, um, it was uh, annexed illegally by Israel and uh, Israeli uh, law and administration have uh, been applied uh, to, to East Jerusalem. Now, one of the things that uh, uh, people are, do not, not, that I'm not sure many people know, is that the Palestinian community uh, uh, of East Jerusalem was not granted with Israeli citizenship. I mean, the territory was annexed by the Israeli government, but the people were not. The people were provided with uh, a permanent residency status. Now that is that is uh, 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 that is a very problematic status because unlike citizenship, um, um, permanent residency is something that is dependent on presence. And Jer East Jerusalemites who leave uh, uh, the uh, uh, Jerusalem for several years to study or to work or for whatever other reason, uh, and then they want to come back. They find that their um, residency has been revoked and they cannot go back to the city where they were born, raised and lived all their lives and their parents and great parents, et cetera, et cetera. But apart from that problem and apart from the problem, the, 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 the fact that uh, um, uh, residency does not uh, confer uh, the residents with, uh, with political rights in the, uh, in the sense of uh, the right to vote and to be elected and, and so on, um, the East Jerusalemites are also subjected within Israeli law, not within the law of the West Bank, not within the military law, but within the Israeli civil law, they are subjected to a discriminating, uh, you know, official discriminating uh, 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 normative framework. And that is done in many uh, uh, ways, but I want to address one of them because it's very relevant to uh, the things that are happening and unfolding these days with the uh, 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 eviction uh, campaigns in, in Sheikh Jarrah and in Silwan and other East Jerusalem uh, neighborhoods, which I know well, I was born in Jerusalem and raised on the borderline between East and West Jerusalem. Now, uh, one has to acknowledge that in, in, in 1950, two years after the establishment of the State of Israel, um, the Israeli parliament has enacted a law that basically, and you know, I, I'll not get into the details, but basically nationalized all the property of the Palestinian refugees. Um, the uh, Absentee Property Act. Um, and and that, that applied to the full territory of the, of the, uh, of the then, um, of the 1949 ceasefire lines, uh, the Green Line uh, uh, territory. Now, in 1967, the East Jerusalem was, uh, was uh, uh, seized by Israel and, and, as I said, annexed. And that law, 
the Absentee Property Act uh, automatically also uh, apply to Israel. Now, I will not discuss that, but, but bear in mind that people who live in East Jerusalem, many of them were refugees from West Jerusalem or other areas in Israel, and they lost their property because of the uh, Absentee Property Act, uh, and, and their property was nationalized by, by Israel. In 1970, three years after uh, the uh, um, after the um, the uh, occupation of East Jerusalem and and its uh, annexation, uh, Israel has enacted a, another law, uh, the 1970 um, um, Law and Administration Regulation Act, which basically said the following. Uh, it said many things, but but for our sake, what is important is that it said uh, property of property that belonged to Israelis prior to 1948 and was seized by the Jordanian custodian of enemy property in East Jerusalem will be retrieved, will be released back to the uh, uh, original owners. So while a Palestinian that lives in Sheikh Jarrah has a house in West Jerusalem, his house from prior to 1948 was nationalized by the state of Israel. It's no longer his a, or her. Um, a Jewish Israeli, or not a Jewish Israeli, any Israeli who has property in East Jerusalem that was, uh, that was uh, um, administered by the Jordanian custodian of enemy property because the Jordanians have not nationalized the property of Jewish refugees who fled uh, uh, East Jerusalem will be able to receive his or her property back. So you see, there is a discriminative, racialized, normative framework in which a, a, an Israeli Jew can retrieve his or her property while the Palestinian refugee cannot. Now that's not the end of it because the original owners, of course, of land or property in East Jerusalem have long perished. And instead of them came all kinds of Israeli settler associations that have a target to Judaize East Jerusalem, and in a in a very uh, in a very uh, uh, controversial way, which I will not get into details, they took over uh, and went in uh, took over the uh, 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 these um, uh, associations that that have been uh, the owners of the land uh, prior to 1948, and then they began. Uh, uh, litigating eviction cases. Now, this is one, one example. The context of the eviction cases in East Jerusalem is the imbalance that is ingrained in Israeli law. So, you know, I took more time than I was supposed to, and of course I can talk forever, so I'll stop here, and I can't wait for the discussion. Thank you. Michael, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, you haven't taken too long. You're well, you're, you're within time. Um, now we need to bring Zahar back because Zahar is key to the next bit of this process, but I seem to have lost her. Zahar is, I think, returning because she's been listening to you. And I think I will start by passing over to her uh, for her comments on what you've been saying so that you can have a conversation. And then when you've done that for a while, we do have some questions that have been fed in by the audience and I will feed those in to both of you. But at the moment, I'm going to pass over to Zaha so that she can uh, continue this discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Zaha. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for your intervention. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to asking you some questions that have been pressing for, for me for some time. Um, the first one is, you know, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the passage of what's been called as the Jewish nation state basic law, which basically forecloses Palestinian refugee return. It makes non-Jewish citizens of Israel open to the possibility of denationalization. And it um, would, would foreclose Palestinian, uh, Palestinians living in the occupied territories from being citizens of an Israeli state to the extent that Israel extends its sovereignty in those parts of the occupied territories. So that's 
in a nutshell, basically what the basic law does. And because it has sort of quasi-constitutional power, um, it's, it's been extremely um, controversial. And I wondered if you could shed more light on why that um, Knesset legislation passed when it did and what you think the prospects are for it being reversed or repealed in the future, given just the extent to which it would entrench, entrench um, disenfranchisement of Palestinians wherever they may be within, uh, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River? That's a huge question. <laughs> um, the, name, the nation state law is a despicable law. Uh, which uh, makes it uh, um, very difficult to refute um, the, the charge that is being mainstreamed these days, that it's not only the occupied territories that are under uh, a form of apartheid, but uh, that uh, Jewish supremacy is being uh, advanced also in, in, in Israel itself, uh, what's you know, so-called the Israel proper. Um, there have been already some remarks by judges, not in the main case that, that uh, challenges the constitutionality of, the, of, the, of this law, but there were already some hints, and I think we'll see that uh, um, getting more and more um, force uh, as uh, judges address this uh, law, that, um, that this law will be um, interpreted as a declaratory law. It has no practical implications. I mean, there's a, one has to appreciate Israel is in an internal war. It's a cultural war. It's a war of values. It's a war on, on the soul of the Israeli uh, society. Um, and there are competing uh, um, ideologies um, drastically opposing one another. I mean, uh, every day, if you read uh, the Israeli, don't read Israeli newspapers, but if you read some of the reports that come out of Israel, you'll see that these are reports from the battle lines. Um, and, um, and, and, and of course, the Israeli uh, nationalistic right would like to have uh, the nation state law as a law that, that is uh, a, a source of interpretation for all other laws and will allow Finally, you know, Baroness Hale mentioned that uh, our laws do not um, provide for equality. Now we have a law that specifically says there will be no equality. Um, and, and on the other hand, uh, the self-proclaimed Israeli liberals would like to, um, to have this law sidelined as a, as, a, as a declaratory that has no practical meaning. Now I have my best friends litigating the challenges against this law, so I don't want to um, say anything that would undermine their very important uh, work. But it seems to me that in the current climate, it will be very difficult for the court to uh, strike out this uh, basic law. Uh, it could dilute it, it could diminish its importance, uh, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, actually Striking out is something that is in the cards. And, and, and while I'm saying that, I'll take one more minute to say something that I didn't have the time before. Again, Baroness Hale um, applauded the Israeli Supreme Court and mentioned Aaron Barak and so on. And I have to say there are two Israeli Supreme Courts. And when uh, a chief justice uh, or a president of uh, a, a, a foreign court comes, uh, he or she is only being greeted by one of the Supreme Courts. And that's the Dr. Jekyll Supreme, Israeli Supreme Court. But the Dr. But the Mr. Hyde Supreme Court that governs um, uh, matters of security and the occupied territories is, is, um, adven is one of the pillars on which the system of the dual legal system and the discriminative and racialized system that I described uh, is responsible for cementing, supporting, allowing, and mainstreaming. So I just wanted to put that, that on, 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 you know, in the record. I would just, you know, on the political side, you know, con 
I was involved in the negotiations. And so I've been watching sort of how the, or how the trajectory got to, got to this point where we had the Jewish nation state law um, passed in 2018. And, you know, it seemed to me that the beginnings of this came out of um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel and their vision document and their efforts to articulate um, sort of the, their a, a political platform for Israel's relationship to Palestinians and um, and trying to develop a permanent constitution that would that would recognize Palestinian indigeneity, support the two state solution, allow for refugee return, and um, you know, freedom and rights for Palestinians living in the occupied territories in, in a, you know, in a state of, of their own. So that was the first time you ever heard Israeli politicians, uh, and in particular, Israeli negotiators um, talk about the need for Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. That was the first time that became a parameter that you know, Israelis were calling for. Um, but it seemed to me that it came out of that effort by Palestinian citizens of Israel to push for a constitution and to put, push for, um, you know, recognition of Palestinian indigeneity. So I wonder what you think of that. I, I, I completely agree. And, and, and having said what I said about the law, now I wanna say something else. The legislation of this law is, is um, shows weakness. It shows um, that the, the Israeli proponents of that law uh, are afraid. Um, and I think that this, is, this comes out of another issue, which I think you are referring to in a way, and that is the question of whether the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about 67 or about 48. And, you know, in the Oslo years, um, Israelis were, um, were told, basically, that once we'll solve this thing about 67, then the conflict is over. And, and, and that, and by the way, I, I, you know, I'm a product of, 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 I was, I got my political education in the 80s and, and I became another, an adult in the 90s. And I, and for me, that was a very, a major thing. You know, we have the conflict is about the occupied, it's the occupied territories are bad and we have to end the occupation. And then you have Israel and yes, we have a minority that is being discriminated against and we have to deal with that, but that's, you know, every country, hey, there are many democracies that have a minority that is being, that is uh, discriminated and, and, and the understanding, the acknowledgement that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has, cannot be solved without going back to 1948 is a, is a scary thing. I, I'm telling this as you as, as an, an Israeli Jew, it's scary. And so some people, um, you know, try to look at the reality uh, straightforward and, and hold the bull by its horns and try to see what can be done. And others legislate uh, nation state laws. <laughs> but but I, I want to ask you something. Um, when someone says right, rights-based approach, um, in, many, in many cases, and it's not, I'm not trying to... Um, it's not, it's not something against it, but I just want to make sure. Usually rights-based based approach is a, a euphemism for one state, for one democratic state. Is that, do you, do you agree? Uh, no, I think <laughs> that it could be. I, I think there are those who, who would, you know, who would advocate for a one state and, and a rights-based approach is their conduit to that one state. But I think you can equally advocate for a two-state and a rights-based approach would be your conduit to a two-state, you know, and, it, you know, we developed um, a policy paper uh, at Carnegie and at the U.S. Middle East Project that talks about this. Um, the idea, though, is that you, just as we, we now see, you can't sublimate the 1948 issues and think you're going to get to a durable political solution. You have to address all of the 
the rights issues that are implicated in, between Israelis and Palestinians, or you're going to postpone indefinitely a political solution and you're going to perpetuate violence on the ground because there's always going to be an effort to push the limits of Israeli um, territorial intentions. And that automatically means Palestinian displacement as we've seen. So you could conceive of a solution where, um, you know, there's two states, there's rights for Palestinian refugees, a choice given of where to live and a, and a mode of getting there and resettlement being an option as choice of, of return. And you, and you know, you make an, you, these things have already been developed by the negotiating teams on both sides. It's not like we don't know how to do this. We've had other uh, experiences with refugee displacement in the past. The problem is we've, we've exceptionalized the case of Palestinian refugees and acted like we just, it's just impossible. And the reason for that is because the international community has really, um, you know, sort of adopted this, this uh, idea that it needs to support ethno-religious divisions and partition. And in the United States in particular, we've seen under the Obama administration, the idea that Palestinians need to recognize Israel as a Jewish state and a homeland for the Jewish people at a time when Israel doesn't have declared borders, that that, has, that is a prerequisite of, for the US in terms of a peace agreement. You know, like that has to be, that has to happen before US is going to support, you know, uh, re-engagement between Israelis and Palestinians on, on um, parameters for peace. Like that is the starting point. And so if that's your starting point and you know that, that there is no mechanism to curb Israeli expansion because the US is not willing to use its, um, its political leverage nor are any other countries in the international community thus far willing to do so. What you're, what you're signaling to Israel is that you better you better take what you can while you can, because there's you know there's no incentive not to. In fact, there's every incentive to to take as much as you can, and that's what we saw when we got to the Trump administration, because the Trump administration was basically saying, "We got your back, Israel. You you've already put your markers down. We'll accept them, and now we need to move on. <laughs> we need to move on to an end of claims, basically." I mean, Palestinians weren't even relevant to that conversation. They were, they were nice to have signing on the dotted line, but if they didn't, it was not necessary to have them. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I share with you the rights-based approach uh, and, um, and I'm, I'm part of a group uh, that is called uh, A Land for All. Um, one state, uh, one homeland, two states, which is a kind of a, um, a, I would call it the two-state solution, the next generation, which has a, a federative or confederative element in it. Because one of the things that seemed to us that was um, a problematic in, in, in the Oslo thesis was the separation that uh, you know, Israelis would stand with their lines to the wall and look westwards and Palestinians will, you know, there'll be a big wall between us and they will look eastwards and, and we'll not see each other again. And, and this, is, this is not possible. We, we, will leave, we will live with each other. And uh, the idea to have uh, open borders and, and freedom of uh, residency in all of the land um, just to say that I know that some of the people who hear me now think that I have to go to an asylum if I say that uh, these days. But I just want to I just want to um, remind people that in 1945, if someone would tell a French uh, person that in you know several decades they will have the same currency, open borders, freedom of movement, uh, and, and 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 shared institutions with the Germans, uh, and they shed much more blood. Uh, shed much more blood uh, than, than we and the Palestinians have, um, they would also be seen as crazy. So I think we have to fantasize and we have to, um, you know, develop uh, um, the, 
the, um, um, the paradigm or the model of, of shared life in this little uh, space. Thank, thank you. I'm conscious that uh, I, I didn't want to interrupt this conversation because in a way it becomes better and better. So <laughs> rather than coming in from outside, there are a large number of questions that come through and some of them may be quite relevant. Um, I, I, I direct them to both of you. It was a very recent one from, um, I'm sorry, I may just have lost it, but it's from um, a, here we are, Mutana Samara. Hello, I'm an Israeli Arab Palestinian, British as well. I'm married to a British Palestinian wife. Being Israeli Arab, I cannot transfer my nationality automatically to my wife, and it's possible she will never get it due to her origin as a Palestinian. While a Jewish person who's married to any person in the world, they can grant their spouses the Israeli nationality that they themselves hold. Um, and that, I suppose, does raise an issue, I put it to Michael, uh, but it, it, it's also, which is, we, we've been tending to look, and Michael, you spoke about the, the, uh, the different rules for um, Israelis living in the West Bank in settlements and West Bank Palestinians. But what about the nature of the Israeli state in terms of its differential rules for uh, those living within Israel, within its 48 borders itself? And how you see that? And also, I'd be quite interested about the, the attitude of the Israeli Supreme Court to, to that facet of, of the issue, uh, particularly in the light of Brenda Hale's comments about the, yours, about the Jekyll and Hyde. And indeed, there was also another associated question I'll come on to, which, which came in, which was, how does the Supreme Court view the obligations of Israel under the Fourth Geneva Convention, which of hmm. course is signatory? Well, um, how, as for the second question, um, I don't wanna uh, um, promote my, my writings, but I wrote 500 pages on that question of how does the Israeli Supreme Court deal with, with, uh, with the question of, of uh, the four, just the, the laws of occupation. Um, I mean, in general, the Supreme Court has accepted that the laws of occupation, the international laws of religion and occupation apply. But in, a, a, in many, many, many cases, um, the interpretation that the Israeli Supreme Court has given to those, to the norms uh, of the uh, Fourth Hague Convention, the regulations annexed to the Fourth Hague Convention and, and to the provisions of the Fourth Geneva Conventions were, um, let's put it that way, they were in, at odds with, with most interpretations of legal, international legal scol scholars around the world. And most uh, uh, importantly, uh, the uh, Israeli Supreme Court has refused, refused to arbitrate the question of the legality of settlements, um, claiming uh, something that is similar to the political question doctrine in America, that is non-justiciable and uh, should be left for the, for the politics to resolve when the politics is only participated by Israeli citizens and not by the subjects, by the victims of, of, the, of the settlement uh, 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 project. Um, so while the Israeli Supreme Court has, has accepted uh, the uh, uh, international laws of religion and occupation as, as the normative framework, it uh, distorted them in almost every possible way. And one of them, you know, I, I have a whole uh, um, um, you know, presentation on how the, um, I call it the rule of the exception. The exceptions that you have in international laws of belligerent occupation became the rules in almost every possible way. If there is an exception that allows a, uh, a administrative detentions, that became the rule. Tens of thousands of Palestinians have been uh, subjected, even maybe even more than tens of thousands, throughout the years uh, to administrative detention. So it's a long, it's a very uh, 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 big topic. Uh, the Israeli Supreme Court and, 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 and the occupation. Um, and I refer you again to my book, The Wall and the Gate. As for your, uh, the first question about uh, um, the discrimination that is ingrained in Israeli law and in the Israeli system. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, there's definitely, um, um, there are 
some um, obvious um, law, some laws that are obviously discriminating and provide privileges to Jews, right, and 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 deny them of any others, uh, members of any other groups. But I think that's not. I mean, and and these examples are uh, very famous. Uh, are not. There are only some examples, but they're very important, like the immigration policy. The immigration laws to Israel are the, probably the most obvious example. But I think that most of the uh, uh, discrimination of Israeli Palestin or Palestinians with Israeli nationality is not done through law necessarily, but through policy, through policy and through practice and through the uh, intentions um, and direction uh, of the Israeli governments, the consecutive governments. They, uh, all of them from 1948 onwards, have been advancing the interests of the Jewish majority. And so uh, you find these uh, uh, um, discriminations, I think more uh, in, in policy rather than in the law itself. And of course, then you have these very uh, uh, important constitutional uh, examples like the law of return and the, now the nation state law, but these are not, these not, do not tell the full story. And that's why I said before that 48 is, uh, you cannot get to 67 before, before going through 48. And the, the, the place, the membership of Israeli, of, of Palestinians that have Israeli nationality in the Israeli society and in the Israeli state is of a paramount importance. And you cannot solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by disregarding that issue. Uh, th thank you. This, Chris Greenwood um, has uh, te texted in a, a question. I mean, in a way it's taking us away from analysis to trying to find a way forward. And I'd be interested both for your take and also Zahar's. He said, to what extent does the pathway to a peaceful and equal rights for all solution lie in the political power of the USA, or for that matter, to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom, or we could also add other, the EU, if we have a role. And if one was trying to change the situation, and granted also, picking up Zahar's point, that asking people who are frightened of each other, or dislike each other, or have grown up to see the other as being a subject of distrust, putting them together and saying, you've got to get on with it is never the easiest thing <laughs> to achieve. And we can see that in a lot of other contexts, including Northern Ireland, where ultimately the ring is held by external actors forcing them to do it, which is not very satisfactory. How do you see the route ahead that might start to make a difference? Well, Michael, would you like to go first, or shall I ask Zahar? <laughs> Zahar, 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 Zahar to go first. Since I'm Pretty coming good. from the U.S., I probably should should offer some thoughts on that. Um, I think the U.S. has a critical role to play, you know, precisely because the U.S. has been the driving force behind, you know, peacekeeping or peacemaking efforts between Israelis and Palestinians, and it holds so much sway with Israel. Um, that's not to say that if tomorrow the U.S. all of a sudden, you know, um, decided it wanted to adopt um, a rights-based approach and was willing to use its levers of power, that that would move Israel the next day to, to change. It's going to take time, but it's absolutely critical for the U.S. to be on board for, for that to happen because the U.S. has been the party that has provided Israel with a political cover and in international fora. It has been the party that has been arming Israel, um, you know, providing it with $3.8 billion in security assistance, free money, um, that has allowed the occupation, the military occupation to endure and to, you know, allow Israel to really prosper as well, because it's been able to, um, you know, money is fungible. So it's able to, to continue to build settlements and whatever, because it's, its defense needs are, are being provided for uh, to a large extent by the U.S. And, and because of the, um, the role that the Jewish American community has played as well in, in its support for Israel, which is now starting to change because of just the very heavy-handed ways in which um, Israel's domination over Palestinians has now entered the um, 
the psyche of folks everywhere in ways that it never could before because of social media and access to information uh, and visuals that people didn't have before. I mean, think how powerful it was to, for Americans to be able to see how African Americans are treated by police in this country when they hadn't seen that, those visuals before, but were able to because of everyone carrying a smartphone and because of police cameras when they're open. So um, similarly, in the case of Israel-Palestine, people everywhere, and in particular, uh, people in America are now seeing images of buildings in Gaza, pancaked. They're seeing, um, you know, bombardment every three years of that, of that um, isolated enclave. They're seeing images inside of Israel of um, mob violence and, you know, hatred and incitement. And they're seeing what's going on in the occupied territories in the West Bank as well. And so it's not something that can be easily dismissed anymore um, as, you know, just, um, you know, part of Israel's effort to defend itself. People aren't buying that anymore. And so there's, it's being challenged in the U.S. definitely. But at the same time as we're seeing challenges to the, the, the narrative that we've had in the past that, you know, Israel's, Israel's policies towards the Palestinians are reactive to Palestinian violence. While we're seeing challenges to that, finally, that narrative, we're also seeing public, you know, spaces closed and attempts by not just um, uh, government, but also by um, platforms, private platforms um, like, um, you know, Facebook and Google and, um, you know, these kinds of social media companies are closing off a discussion and debate right at the moment in which there's, there's this opportunity for people to reconsider our a past U.S. policy in particular and, and, you know, sort of what's going on in Israel, uh, Palestine more generally. So I, I do think it's, it's really important. I'm concerned, though, that... Um, that this effort to contain uh, public spaces and to censor uh, what we're seeing and hearing uh, about what's taking place is going to impact how, you know, how fast <laughs> we're going to be able to get to the point where we can see that translated into policy change in Congress and, and within the administration. So, <clears throat> I, I agree with Zaha about um, the crucial role of the American uh, administration, but I don't want to take Europe and the UK off the hook. So let me say something about you guys. Um, the, our neighborhood, Israel's neighborhood is not America, it's Europe. Most of our commerce is with Europe. Um, when Israelis go for a weekend, they don't go to New York for a weekend. They go to London, to Paris, to Rome. Um, what I'm trying to say is that Europe has much more leverage than, uh, than it thinks, or actually, more precisely, is ready to use. And that is because the European and, 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 and British uh, policy on Israel-Palestine is, is pathological. It is handicapped for historical reasons, for whatever reasons. And I think that this is changing because the first, the first uh, stage or the first step is a change that we see, and, and, and Zaha talked about it in America, but also in, in, in Europe, in civil society. International civil society is in a completely different place than it was several years ago. Jewish uh, communities in Europe and, in, and, and especially in America have traveled miles from when, where they were a decade ago. There are things that can be said today in a synagogue in whatever uh, um, city in America that was unheard of, unspeakable uh, only a few years ago. And I think that there is a, there is a, um, uh, a gap between the change in, in civil society and, when it, and, and the time that it translates into po political capital and uh, I, I, I think that this is something we'll see uh, uh, coming in the future. And unfortunately, we need that. We need that external pressure because 
uh, it seems like we cannot, we do not have the internal strength to do it by ourselves. Of course, there is a need for an internal, um, um, you know, force for change also, but it has to be enhanced and coupled and quadrupled by pressure from outside. Uh, th th thank you very much. That's, uh, I think, very interesting um, as to whether there might be a, a route forward. Um, and how, just to take it a stage further, and perhaps it's to Michael, and I find this, within Israel, you spoke about this internal debate. And I think on the whole, we don't hear very much of that here. We, we hear you. And then the question is, is, is Michael Spard a complete exception <laughs> to what's going on in Israel? Or is this really quite a widespread point of view where we're failing to pick up the, the nature of the democratic dialogue, which does still exist in Israel? And anybody who goes there realizes this. Um, and is this something that can be built on? Or is it always going to be rather one sided as it would appear to be at the moment? No, so I, I don't want to make any, to to uh, provide any illusions. Um, the positions that I express here are a, a minority and a very small minority in Israel. But the, but I, I was not referring to specifically my positions or my colleagues, my friends, the human rights community in Israel, which is a progressive. Uh, you can almost say avant-garde, but not you know more than avant-garde because we have more influence than just an avant-garde. Uh, but it is a minority, even within the what uh, again is, is is used to be called the, the the democratic camp in Israel. But I was referring more to the set of values. What is the set of values that uh, Israelis want our country to be based on? And here you have a split. You have a real split. You know, is it going to be a country that goes the path of? rule of law in the good sense of the, of the, of the concept um, uh, with, with uh, uh, um, civil liberties and human rights and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, separation of powers and freedom of the press and, all, and freedom of art and all of these liberal things, or we go on the path of a Putinist type of, uh, um, of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, um, majority, uh, it's all about a technical democracy. Once the majority makes its uh, vote, that's it. Um, and in that respect, there is a clash. Now, how do we get more Israelis to the point of, you know, agreeing with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, ideas that I expressed? I believe that first and foremost, you cannot think of it as a linear process. It will not, you know, we have a tendency, tendency as human beings, when we want to get somewhere, we want to see signs that we're coming closer and closer. You know, we're driving somewhere. We're seeing you're 60 miles away. Now you're 50 miles away. You know, you're making a progress. We don't see that, right? But it doesn't work that way. There are many, many things that, that many processes that happen underground and create cracks. And we don't see the cracks because they're underground. We're standing on the ground and it seems firm. And, and one day, these cracks will combine for whatever reason, there will be all the stars will be aligned and the pressure will be right and the force from within will be right. And, and, and then it will all happen at once. And then suddenly everyone was in the resistance. Everyone was, was fighting against apartheid. Everyone was against the, the, the occupation. So, you know, I don't know when it will happen, but, but it has to. Thank you. Zahar? Any thoughts? No, I think I, I think I pretty much agree with everything uh, Michael said. Well, I'm conscious that we are coming, I think, quite close to the time when we were going to draw this to a conclusion. And you've been in the hot spot, both of you, <laughs> for really rather a long time. Uh, there are large numbers of questions that have poured in, I think some of which we've dealt with. Some of them have been quite specific and perhaps a little over away from, from the main theme. So I apologize to those whose questions I haven't been able to pick, but I hope we've been able to embody in this discussion a little bit of the, uh, of, uh, 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 of the, of the main theme. And in a way, I, don't, I think 
I quite like to leave it on this note because it was rather a <laughs> note and an optimistic note rather than going somewhere else. That <laughs> really happens. <laughs> So I think it's my task, really, to to draw the strands to conclusion. Somebody said, do I want to make a few remarks? Well, yes, I do. I'd like, firstly, to thank Saha, Yuzaha and Michael very much, because I, I, I did find this a riveting presentation. And as I say, it left me with an optimistic sense. Uh, and ultimately, um, as, as we all know in politics, change does come because people are prepared to articulate it and to do it in a way which says there's a way through this. Whereas I think that so much of the problem that exists at the moment is because nobody has any faith that there's a way through it. So it's much easier to live with a status quo. I certainly felt that when I came to Israel back in my couple of visits I've made, one as Attorney General, and then went over to Ramallah and stayed with Vincent in Jerusalem. That has always seemed to me to have been one of the main problems. Um, and we can also look forward to, I think, some invigorating debate and discussion tomorrow on which I think I pass over to um, uh, to, um, I think, Vincent, who is going to say a few words about it. And I see him coming on. So I shall pass it over. I just, again, my thanks on behalf of all who have attended this, to you, Michael, and to you, Zaha, for uh, this tremendous debate and discussion. Vincent. Thank you very much, Dominic, and thank you for your time and energy and wisdom today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be very brief at this point. Um, my role is to say two things. First of all, to draw your attention to tomorrow. Uh, at two o'clock UK time tomorrow, uh, Andrew Whitley, my, my fellow trustee of the Balfour Project, will uh, set the scene for the day. We then have uh, Professor Michael Link from Canada, the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Observer for the UN uh, Human Rights Commissioner uh, for the OPT, and then four case studies uh, led by uh, Issam Yunis, uh, followed by Hagit Ofran, Saha Francis, and Nada Kiswanson. And they will be covering Gaza, of course, Islam Yunus speaking from Gaza, uh, the settlement project with Hagit Ofran, uh, the question of Palestinian children in Israeli military detention uh, with Saha Francis, and then the large issue of accountability, which we've already heard a lot about today, with Nada Kiswansan. Um, after that, we have a parliamentary session uh, chaired by Lord Alderdice, John Alderdice, with uh, uh, a talk by Jack Straw, and then panel discussion by four parliamentarians, including Saeed Awarsi, uh, mon moderated by John Alderdice. And at the end of the day, Andrew Whitley will conclude. Um, my other point to make is a gentle one. Uh, the Balfour Project is a charity. Uh, we survive uh, on public donations from people like you, and I would ask you if you have found benefit in today to think about contributing to the work uh, through funding of the Balfour Project. And that's possible by looking in the chat and seeing how to do that. Regular giving is our aspiration, but any donation is a good donation. Thank you. And on that note, can I thank everybody who's spoken today? Can I thank all the questioners for their, uh, for their questions? And we will make sure that the panelists see the questions. And we're grateful to Dominic for moderating uh, and handling the questions today. My last word is to say thank you to Diana Safier, who has made this event happen and will do so tomorrow. So I hope to see you all tomorrow at two o'clock. Bye bye.